Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're going to have fun today. I'm going to talk about one of the one of the uh, best topics we can talk about and laugh, and that is benefits. Um, as you all know, benefits don't work together. So before we get started, though, let me introduce myself for those who don't know me. Some of you do. I already know. I'm Claudia Porpelia. Um, I am a professional guardian. I also work as a care manager, benefits consultant, disability advocate with Guardian Care Management, Teresa Barton. Um, and I've been with her about 13 years now. Um, before that, I had family members that I had to help with benefits and care, et cetera. Since I came with Teresa, um, I have made it my mission to learn about Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare and how they don't work together um, because they don't. There's a disconnect. None of the agencies really talk to each other. They will share, um, they will share information occasionally, like um, basic information, but when it comes to talking to each other, they don't do it. And that's a big problem. Um, so we're going to kind of start with SSI and work through this. We're going to end up with APD because that does affect some other things. And we're going to try to give you some tips and some things to consider so that it isn't as hard for you. So SSI, most of you probably, are, probably already know, SSI is a need-based program. It's for people who either don't have 40 quarters within a certain amount of time for, towards retirement, or people who haven't worked at least five years in the last 10 years. A lot of people don't know that that affects your ability to collect SSA benefits, possibly. There's, there's all these little quirks to it and how you get it. SSI is, well, it used to be you applied for SSI. Now, because of COVID, you apply for SSDI and SSI. Um, so you go, you can do an online application, uh, you do the standard thing and somewhere in the online application, it says, are you also applying for SSI? And you check yes. Um, I happen to have an SSI application hidden in my forms, and I occasionally fax an actual SSI application in to the Social Security office. The process gets muddled because you're now going to get a, a letter that says you are not eligible for disability. Um, I've worked with a lot of families, and they get that letter, and no matter how many times I tell them, they panic. They've been denied. No, you haven't been denied. You've been denied for SSDI, not SSI. Um, and there's no explanation of that. SSI is a limited program because it's a need-based program. And what I mean by that is you have to be able to prove that the individual getting SSI is paying their fair share of either household expenses or rent and food. Well, this year it was $914. I don't think most of us could live on $914 a month. Um, it would be pretty hard. So, um, and in the case of them living at home or living with a relative, you have to be able to prove that mortgage, rent, whatever you're paying, electric, water, gas, and food, divided by the number of people in the household, it's under $914. If it isn't, they reduce you by one third. Some of you may have gotten some clients who at some point lived at home and you can't figure out why they're not getting the full amount. About 95% of the time, that's the problem. It was never updated with social security or they can't make their expenses and that becomes the problem. Social security for the younger ones uh, um, is even more important. So when you have a developmentally disabled, someone that's been in an accident, um, whatever reason they're, they're unable to be gainfully employed, you want to get them SSI. 
and you want to get them SSI with the disability on Social Security's end, considered they are considered disabled before the age of 22. 22 is the magic number. 18 for APD, 22 for this. Able, it's 26 and going up soon. None of these numbers jive. So 22 is the magic number with Social Security. Here's the little quirky thing. How do they determine when somebody's disabled? Um, and, you know, well, let me back up before I get into that. The, the importance of this is two, twofold, having a disability eligibility before the age of 22. One is that if they go on SSDI at some point on a parent's record, they don't have to live with the parents. They don't even have to have ever known the parents, okay? Mm -hmm. If they go on a parent's record, they uh, they get approximately half of whatever the parent's full social security is. And almost always that is a higher amount than SSI. The other benefit with the money is you no longer have to prove they're paying room and board. It's crazy. They go up to $1,400 a month and you now do not have to prove that they pay their own way in the world because it is an earned benefit. It is based on someone's credits. So that's the first reason that it's important because the child will, or the, the disabled adult child, DAC, will, the minute a parent retires, becomes disabled, or gets hit by the beer truck, they will move to an SSDI benefit based on the parent. The second one is even more important. So there is a protection in the Palms Law that says if they're a disabled adult child and their SSDI benefit is more than the income limit for Medicaid, they get to keep their Medicaid. Why is that important? Well, eventually they get Medicare, but they have to wait 24 months for their Medicare. If we didn't have that law, they would have no insurance for two years, not health insurance. The other reason is because when they go on Medicare, they now have Medicare and Medicaid. And any, any of you who have dealt with that, almost everything's covered. And you have a lot of options. So the DAC benefit is really important, but this is where it gets muddled. So you and I would think that if they are born with autism, Down syndrome, whatever it is, okay, that they would be considered disabled from birth. That isn't how Social Security looks at it right now. Used to, but they don't anymore. Doesn't matter what the Palms Law says. I'm just sharing with you what I've seen over and over again with the Social Security offices and the disability offices. So the problem is that you have to, you have to give a date. Some people use birth. Some people use the date that they got an actual diagnosis. Some people use age 18 because that would be the soonest if the family is doing well, that someone could get SSI anyway. So you use that date. The biggest concern is just making sure that the disability is, the eligibility is before the age of 22. Um, in the last few years, we're running into a lot of people who want to see if their kids can make it. So they, um, they want to see if their kids can make it. So they try to have them get a job. They have them go to school. Some of them get a degree, but when it comes to the work world, they can't function. And then at 25 or 26, the parents want to file for SSI. Technically, technically by law, they were disabled before the age of 22, but it is very common for social security and the disability office to make the date, the date the application went in. Occasionally, you'll get a, a representative from Social Security that'll go back three years and put it back. But if they're 26, three years isn't going to help you. So I've spoken to an attorney here in Orlando who does Social Security cases because I was very frustrated with this. We, we were having parents come and talk with us and they had waited because they thought it was great for their child. And now they're going to miss out on this benefit. So I learned through this person that if that ever happens, if you get someone that the parents, you become guardian of somebody that the parents never filed for benefit and you 
you want the disability date back so that they get the advantage of the DAC benefit, fight it. Because by law, they're supposed to use when they became disabled, not when you applied. Um, and this has been going on for a while. I mean, as transitions in social security have happened over the last probably 15 years or so, this is happening. The other thing we have going on right now, and any of you who have been to the so local social security office probably know it, a lot of the seasoned employees retired during COVID. So now we're dealing with people who there's a 1200 page law and they're supposed to know all of it. The other aspect is a lot of them are working from home. When they were in the offices, if I asked a question and they didn't know it, they would walk over to someone's desk and ask and get me an answer. Now they have to send a message. And if the person sees it, maybe they'll get an answer. But if they don't, you don't get an answer or you get an answer that you can't be sure is correct. So SSI and DAC, the significance is DAC is the Disabled Adult Child Act. And it says that a child that is deemed disabled before the age of 22 is entitled to part of their parents' benefit, even if they never, you know, never lived with them. It can sometimes mean that it's a, a grandparent. In this day and age, there are sometimes. I advise people if they get in that situation, adopt them. Make sure that they're on your benefit, especially if the parents were a deadbeat. Um, and then the Medicare, the fact that they can get the Medicare and keep the Medicaid and have full health care coverage. Um, FFDI really should be called four different things, technically. There is SSDI for a disabled adult child. That's the benefit because they became disabled before 22. There's SSDI because you fell off a ladder and you are a roofer and you can't work anymore. There's SSDI for dependent children. If a parent passes away or becomes disabled before they are 18. There's SSDI that a wife can qualify for if, or a husband, if the spouse becomes disabled and they're not working. So, this is kind of like ice cream. Uh, that's one of Teresa's favorite things to, to say. It's kind of like Baskin Robbins. You walk into Baskin Robbins and you say, I want an ice cream. You're not going to get ice cream because they don't know what you want. So you need to know kind of how it works so that when somebody says, oh, no, they're not eligible for this, you kind of know what you're asking for. Um, I know we shouldn't have to know that. The experts at Social Security should, but I have learned not. Here's another aspect of SSDI and disabled adult children. So many young people today get on SSI and they go through voc rehab or they have a friend of the family and they work a small job, okay? They work a small job and they're putting money into the social security system. A lot of people don't realize a young person that starts that way does not have to work 40 quarters to start getting SSDI from the social security system. There is a graduated scale up to, I think, the, I believe it's the age of 35. And it's a graduated scale of how much they have to work. It doesn't even have to be full time. So then what happens when someone who's on SSDI, I mean, SSI, they were deemed disabled by social security before the age of 22, but at 30, they start getting their SSDI benefit. And then, a parent retires. They are supposed to move from their personal SSDI to half of the parents, if that is more, okay? Because it's still an earned credit. Um, I will tell you that doesn't happen. I just, I've been working with a family for three years and didn't realize that the young man was not getting half of his mother's social security. We're not sure if it's half of dad's because they don't have dealings with him or if he worked for a while, if it's his. It's one of those things at the first of the year, we're going to go up to Social Security and fix because every dollar that they can have helps to sustain them. Um, I do have 
two things available that Kate from Agent can send you. Um, one is a bulletin that I actually got from someone at the Lake Mary Social Security Office when we were battling some things with Medicaid, um, because Medicaid in the state of Florida was turning off Medicaid if the SSDI was more than uh, more than what Medicaid said they could have an income. And this is a law that was passed in 1987, and it states that if they are a disabled adult child, that they can keep Medicaid even if their SSDI is over the income limit. You still have to keep the $2,000 asset limit, okay? Social Security will tell you, oh, you go on SSDI, you don't have to observe the asset limit. If you want Medicaid, you do. Again, the breakdown between the agencies. Um, and then I also have the actual law. Um, it's two pages. And on the second page, um, on the second page, uh, under section six, so if you get it, you can look at it. It states very clearly, provides for continuation of Medicaid coverage for individuals who lose their eligibility for SSI because of entitlement to or an increase in social security benefits received as adult disabled children. Back then they said adult disabled children. Now they say disabled adult child. In effect, creates a new group of individuals who are eligible for Medicaid. Prior to this change, these individuals could become ineligible for Medicaid because of the loss of SSI eligibility. Another thing I want you to note about the wording, and I've had a few, before COVID, I had a few conversations in Lake Mary where I thought the security guard was gonna call me off. It says very clearly that they lose their eligibility. So does that mean they have to have already had the benefit? So does that mean if you don't apply uh, or they don't get a benefit till later that they can't get this? Or does it mean that if a parent has um, passed away or become disabled before the child was 18 and they go on SSDI based on that, that they can't qualify for the disabled adult child benefit? I've spoken to a number of people in the world of social security that help individuals. And we are all convinced that eligibility means they would have been eligible. Does, it doesn't say they were getting the benefit. Part of the reason this has happened, and some of you have been in guardianship for a long time may know this, um, back up until probably, well, until they upgraded their computer system, probably, I want to say about 20, 15 to 20 years ago, social security would take someone who was a DAC. And when they went to SSDI, they kept $1 of SSI and all the rest of the money was SSDI. This was so Medicaid would be aware that they are eligible for this. Now they have a list that DCF doesn't check. I can tell you they don't check it because I've had to call and the guy will say, well, I have a list here, I'll check it. Oh yeah, they should be on Medicaid. So, you know, again, all of these things are things, I don't expect you to remember them all, but kind of put in the back of your mind because you inherit cases where you know something's wrong with benefits, but you don't know what it is. And unless the person has money, most of the attorneys that do social security do not want to deal with that. They don't want to touch it because it's not to their advantage. But these, having these pieces of paper for when something goes wrong, I've used it with DCF, Access Florida, many times to get somebody's benefit turned back on after they went on SSDI and they stopped it. My own daughter's benefit was turned off when she went to SSDI. I couldn't believe it. I talked to Social Security, everything was done right. When I called DCF, they wanted me to go through the full application process and send them bank statements, et cetera. I said, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, but I sent them so they would turn it back on because she needed a med. But in the meantime, I got hold of Tallahassee. And what happened is I got a hold of somebody in Tallahassee who admitted they have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. The DAC people are losing their Medicaid and then they have no health insurance coverage for 24 months. That's a huge amount of time um, to be without benefits. 
So having this knowledge and knowing. Now, applying for SSI or SSDI. The key with it is you list every condition the person has. You list them in order, though. The one that is re results in them being the most disabled, you list first and you go down. If you have someone with autism, you do autism, you do ADHD, you do language impaired, you do you, most of my autistic clients, um, their application has at least eight things listed for their for their conditions, because all the other things come with it. Anxiety. Um, most of them have some form of anxiety. Um, make sure that you fill it out completely. You can't, I mean, if a question doesn't apply, fine, but if you need to fill it out as completely as possible. Once, I don't know how many of you know the process, but once an application goes in, it goes to the local social security office. They review it. Usually the representative that reviews it writes a summary and they send it to the Department of Health Social Security Disability Office. In Orlando, it's near Fashion Square Mall. Every area has an office. There it goes on someone's desk and there is a team of three to five people, including a medical person of some sort, who reviews the information, looks at records. That's the other thing. If you have records, send it with the application. I know they say they will get it, but if you have records, send them. If you have IEPs, if you have psychologicals, if you have medical records that show what, that you know they had a traumatic brain injury at the age of five, send it with the application. I can't tell you how many times I've had an application denied. And when they said what evidence they used, there were almost no medical records on it. Whether they didn't ask for them or whether the medical providers didn't provide them, I don't know. But the key is you want to give them as much as you can. Then after it goes to the disability office, you start getting these forms like adult function report, third party adult function report. They want the individual to fill out a report. Uh, many of these individuals can't fill out a report. So what do you do? You've got to fill it out. So in I do, you know, I, I or someone that knows the individual does the adult function report. And you have to be very careful because it asks, can they bathe? Can they dress? Can they eat, feed themselves? Can they? Well, they may be able to dress. Do they put on clean clothes? Do they put on appropriate clothing? Be descriptive. It's very important to be descriptive. Um, you know, do they practice good hygiene? Um, one of the questions on it that I always laugh about is why can't they drive? So you have somebody that's bedridden and you're asking why they can't drive, but you need to answer it. Silly, but you do it. Sometimes they send people for evaluations, et cetera. The key is this is something that all of us in on this Zoom call pay into the system. And if somebody's going to get it, I want it to be somebody who cannot work and is disabled. And so I'll fight. Often you're denied the first time, especially when it comes to autism um, and even intellectual disability, because the schools are doing a much better job of teaching them practical skills. And that comes into play with an IQ score. IQ score is a combination of the intellectual and the practical, but that doesn't mean they can work a job that would support them. So, um, you know, I, I, I tell people, you have to think of it that way. You have to take the time to think through, okay, what, what are they really asking me? They also ask redundant questions. So they'll ask almost the same question two or three times. Don't answer it the same, reword it. Yeah, it takes a little effort, but I find that when people answer it the same, they get rejected. So let's say you get a denial. It gives you a couple options on a denial. One is an informal conference. I only did one of those because the mother had already filed the form. I don't think I'll ever do an informal conference again. Um, the person sat behind a counter. The young man sat in a chair. The question she asked, he wasn't giving the right answers, but he never asked the other people in the room if they were correct or not. And she denied him a second time. 
I do like the reconsideration. A reconsideration takes the file from the desk it was on originally at disability and puts it on someone else's desk. And a fresh set of eyes look at it. You can also add information at that point. Um, I have found in general, for, for me, the experience I've had the last about seven years is about 95% of the time, it gets approved on the second time if it got rejected the first time. Um, the next step is a hearing um, in front of an administrative judge. When I, you know, I've done six of them now. Um, and, you know, it's not that hard. Part of the problem is our social security law has not caught up to the interventions we're doing with these young people. So uh, I guess the best example I can give is in the 1980s, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, those, those disorders started showing up. The social security law did not cover those and they would reject them. COPD was another one that in the beginning, it was hard for you to get um, approved. It's the same thing here. The law hasn't caught up. When I go to a hearing, I don't even ever mention the law, <laughs> ever. I mention why this person can't function in a job. I give examples if they've tried a job. And so far, so far, uh, my luck has been good. The judges know the law is behind. They are very aware. Um, so that's kind of the social security part of this. Now I kind of want to go from there um, and I want to segue into how Medicaid and APD and DAC benefits and all these things don't come together. So up until a few, well, first of all, I don't know how many of you know, but Medicaid has five and a half pages of Medicaid codes in minuscule print. Like I'd have to have my nose on the paper to read it. And many of those codes, the coverage is the same, but it's how the person became eligible. So a disabled adult child gets the protected SSI Medicaid, okay? That had a code. To, um, APD is Title 19 Medicaid, okay? Well, there's and there's many others. So what has happened is for years, DCF, kept the protected Medicaid code on the file and added the APD code when the person went to agency for persons with disabilities and started getting funding. Now they switch the code. So they take out the protected Medicaid code in the Medicaid system and they put it as Title 19 Medicaid for APD. Why is that a problem? Again, depending on the age of the child, it can be a problem and it can be a problem when they move from SSI to SSDI. Um, I have, like I said, I have learned there is a list that DCF has access to that is a list of everyone that is a DAC beneficiary and they're able to check it, but they don't check it unless you ask. Um, and many times you ask and the person will say they don't know what you're talking about. Um, but it's important to know that they change the codes because if something goes wrong, you need to know why. Because if they're on APD benefits, if they're in a group home, when they lose Medicaid, they lose APD the same day, okay? It, it's gone. Um, I had a family that had support, in-home support, and their son lost his Medicaid and his APD benefits. You have one year to get those APD benefits before you have to start all over and apply again. Well, and any of us that know anything about benefits, it, things don't happen fast. In their case, something had been left to this young man and he didn't know it. And I mentioned that to us as guardians because sometimes that happens with our, our wards because we don't know all the family. We didn't know that grandma had stock and it's electronic and it's, it's social security has found out about it. Medicaid has found out about it. And now suddenly they don't have their benefits. And the funny thing is social security will tell you that it's stock or they'll tell you that it's a bank account. They will not tell you where from. 
because they don't have that information. They only have general information. This family took nine months searching and finally found electronic bonds and made it under the wire. So again, as, as guardians, we say all of that won't happen to us. Now that's not true because many times we inherit cases where elderly family members are still alive um, and um, they've done something and they don't know the importance of not handing something directly to the individual. They don't understand that benefits stop. You know, things need to go through a trust versus being handed to them directly. So that awareness is important. So APD, the code changes. They actually do a Medicaid application, even if the individual is already on Medicaid. Okay. Um, it, the APD local office actually submits one. They'll ask for bank statements from you, et cetera. You're going to say, well, they already have Medicaid. No, just give them the bank statements because now they have to be transferred to a new program. And even though the requirements are the same, they have to have all of this. Um, this doesn't happen until you get funding. And I suspect some of you have run into situations, possibly, I know a lot of guardians don't have a lot of developmentally disabled, but where they don't have funding yet, that doesn't apply then because they, they're not getting anything. But the minute they're offered services and funding, they have to switch Medicaid programs. Um, so that, that is really, really important because again, that may be the only option you have for housing, maybe the only option you have for support for them. Maybe it's in home support for somebody that actually the family may have left something in a trust and you're able to bring in, in home, uh, personal care or companions to take them in the community. You want to make sure you get that benefit. APD. Um, there's going to be several handouts that you have access to. One is, uh, let me find it here. Um, one is the definitions, the definitions of the disabilities. And that the definitions tell you the seven, actually it's eight, I think now, disabilities that they cover. And it tells you what they're expecting. Where this gets difficult. Yes, right there. So, and you can get that from, hey, it has been updated since this one, but it hasn't been changed a lot. They just changed some of the wording. It didn't really change the meaning of the document. What I want to point out about this is autism has become a problem. So autism is the first one listed on here. And it says it means a condition that meets the requirements of section 393063 of Florida State that the condition is pervasive, meaning always present and without interruption, okay? Neurologically based, well, every developmental disability is neurologically based at some point. Extended duration, well, if they're autistic, it's gonna be extended duration. Causes severe learning disorders, results in severe communication disorders, goes through a whole list. The problem with this is if you ask somebody from APD, so define severe communication disorders. They can't tell you what it is. You know, someone who can't, their receptive language is poor, isn't going to be able to work in lots of situations because they'll react wrong, because they misinterpret what's said. Um, then we get into the even worse, the severe, when they talk about severe um, behaviors. So in the past, even though they talked about those things in the law, someone who was diagnosed with autism could get on the wait list for APD, okay? Now they may be on the bottom of the list because their needs are not high, but they could get on the list. Um, over the last, well, during COVID, this started. During COVID, they started using severe behavior problems as their reason to not approve someone. They didn't really have severe behavior. Um, and the first two hearings I had with APD that were denied, I understood. But the third one was a girl that did have severe behaviors. It's documented. She had them at church. She had them at school. She had them at home. Um, you know, and... The, the parents did a very good job of documenting it and submitting it to APD. 
And when we had the hearing, they had a psychologist there. She said, didn't meet the standard. So I looked at the psychologist on the virtual and I said, okay, so define what autism and severe de behavior are. Well, I really can't define it. So then I looked at the representative from APD that was sitting there and I asked him and he goes, well, we really, you, you know, we just know when it's too severe. Because the funding is low, they're doing that. I pretty much now, um, when somebody asks me, should they apply if they have a higher functioning autistic individual, I tell them they can apply, but don't plan on getting approved because they've reworded the law enough that there's a lot of wiggle room for them, not for the individual. This also talks about the other disorders that they cover. Another sheet I have is a list of what you need to provide with your APD application as proof. Um, and if you want that, Kate will send it to you. Intellectual disability, they have a list of documents that they want as many of those as you can get. That can be a problem if you inherit somebody uh, as a guardian, you inherit somebody that's 35 years old, 40 years old. We had a guy that was in his 50s uh, when I first came to uh, guardian care um, was Down syndrome, but there was no proof of anything because he's that old and there's no records. Schools destroy records within three to six years. Three to six years, other than the transcript, the records are destroyed. Um, if family hasn't kept records, then you can be in trouble. I am, I am of the mindset. So I have a 38 and a half year old daughter that gets APD benefits. Luckily, I've kept quite a bit of her records because about seven years ago, APD contacted me and said, you know, we never got any records on her when we approved her for APD. We need records proving her disability. Now, I told them I wasn't going to provide it because they've already approved her. She had services. I did provide it later, but I told them, I said, how can you go back and ask for something when you've approved a case um, based on the information you had? So again, the, the, these are the things you need. Autism, they want school records, IEP reports, but then you also have to have proof of the pervasiveness of the disorder. Um, so that's another one that will help you. Um, the last one on there, you guys won't deal with a lot. That's three to five, but the high risk for developmental disability in case you have family members or anything. The purpose of trying to get some kind of services between three and five is because they can go into the school system, but summers, they get nothing. And if you don't have a health plan that will give them therapies, sometimes you can get approved for temporary services just in the summer. The last thing I have for APD um, that I want to uh, want to uh, make accessible to you is the actual checklist for crisis. So crisis has three. There are three crisis categories. One is homeless. Person's homeless. Now you have to think outside the box. You have to think outside the box a little bit here. If you have someone who has been living at home with their parents, and I have this situation right now in a care management case, the parents become ill and they can't take care of the person. Even though I found a temporary housing for them, they need to get in a group home and they need group home funds. So technically they're homeless. I'm just not letting them live on the street. And I'm using that to get them funding. It takes a long time, it's not fast. It's usually at least six months. So you have to, you kind of have to think out of the box when you think about homeless, you know, um, the, the, and they tell you, you know, you don't have to have every single thing on the checklist, but you need to have enough to give yourself a chance and give the individual a chance. The second category is danger to self or others. Um, this one is a little tricky because most parents who have aggressive children don't want to call the police, okay? They don't. And most of us as guardians don't want to call the police on because then we have to deal with that. But the reality is any kind of documentation of the behavior from school, from police, from DCF is helpful. It is risky. I had a family that called the police and their son got hauled off in handcuffs and spent two nights in jail. Um, 
you know, but they got benefits after that incident. He got traumatized, you know? So again, you have to kind of weigh how badly do you need what you need? Um, and then the last category is caregiver unable to provide care. For us as guardians, this is our ace in the hole if somebody is eligible for APD. We have no obligation to physically care for the individual we have. We have an obligation to get a medical treatment. We have an obligation to make sure they're safe, et cetera, et cetera. But physically care, matter of fact, I encourage every guardian, do not have somebody come live in your house that you're guardian of. The liability in that is huge. And the accusations that can come out of that are huge. So this is one, if you inherit a case, because we all know the judges like to just hand cases over sometimes, and you inherit a case and it's an individual who's developmentally disabled, whether they're on APD's list or not, if they aren't, you do an application. And at the same time, you request prices at the same time. If they're already on the wait list, but don't have services, you use the fact that their primary caregiver can no longer care for them for whatever reason. Doesn't matter why you're the guardian. Doesn't matter if DCF came in and said, you can't care for them anymore. Doesn't matter if they're sick. It doesn't matter if they've passed away. This is one that guardians can use. Um, and the key with all of it is just documenting why they need funds to be in a better environment. And I'll even go to the extent of not just group home, supported living. So maybe they have, the home was left to them, but to stay in the home, they need supported living. They need someone to come, a companion to come in, personal care person. I have a young man right now, he'll be turning 30 in December that I've been helping since October of last year. His father passed away. His mother's been gone for 12 years. He wants to stay in the family home. He has cerebral palsy, uses a power chair, has trouble speaking because of his cerebral palsy, but he is bright as bright can be, graduated with honors from high school. He wants to be home. The first thing we did, now luckily he was already on benefits, but the first thing we did after I got involved was file for more hours of support so that he could safely stay in his home. The second thing we're going to do is ask for adaptations to the home because they're his dad never had adaptations done and he needs to be able to access the kitchen better. He needs So again, these are more just to kind of help you to think about what to do. The last little thing I'm going to say, and then I'll go for questions is if you have an APD client, you may or more than likely are going to in the next year or two get a letter saying they're cutting their services and funding. Um, I'm going to encourage you to fight that. But how you fight it is gather information of why they need the level of support they need. You know, why they can't be cut. The, the group home is going to throw them out because they're going to put them at a level and they're a high, they require care. And have the group home gather information. And I tell people, you have to ask for a hearing, but I submit a letter with the evidence a week before the hearing and I've had several times where APD has called me literally the day before the hearing. One time I had them call me the morning of a hearing and say, we've reviewed the evidence and we're keeping the funds where they are. I understand they're under pressure. Everybody wants to bring in managed care. And managed care is not the answer for the developmentally disabled. Um, the elderly, it hasn't worked great. Okay, It hasn't been a fix in Florida. But at least the elderly have many similarities. Developmental dis disabilities is everything from somebody laying in a bed who can't move to somebody who walks and talks and can even work a part-time job and everything in between. So, you know, they're not motivated to keep handing out money if they can cut it. But by the same token, you have a responsibility to take care of somebody. And if they don't have funds or if they have limited funds, you have a 30-year-old and they have $50,000 in the bank and they're in good health other than their developmental disability, $50,000 is nothing. It's a drop in the bucket if they don't have support from a government agency. So anyway, I hope that was kind of helpful. I, I helpful. It's um, There's no way to present on these kind of benefits and like do one, two, three, four, because they all overlap. They all run into each other and they all don't work together. So do we have any questions?
oh, silence. Either I did a good job or I did too much. Kelly. I have a, so I have a lady who is in her 60s and she was, she became disabled like at 12. She was pretty severely beaten um, by her natural parents and her parents, she had adoptive parents, but I can't find any records that go back that far because she's in her 50s and she lived in New Hampshire. And so now I'm trying to, now she lives down here and I can't find any records that medical records that go back that far. So what suggestion do you have 